Okay, okay. good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, good to see you all, bright and breezy. Uh, yeah. We are recording today, so we have a couple of people there. Um, so online. online, we've got Erin uh, from our finance team and Carrie, who's helping us with the video recording this morning. I'm also expecting Councillor Switchell. Cool. And Councillor Williamson, I think. Uh, uh, You've got yeah. a lot of teams, but a little bit late. And Councillor Rankin might just. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, everyone else around the room, Collie's in the way. Firstly, I haven't been here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay, right. We'll get straight into it. So we've got quite a bit to cover. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. No, that's not good. Right. Yeah. I'll use my big girl voice. Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and um, thanks for coming along. Um, today we'll primarily be led by Andrew and all these. Gentlemen and ladies back here, um, who will be presenting on their projects that you have seen with us before. Um, before we get into it, um, I've given you a bit of paper that has a beautiful picture of project plan for the LTP on it. Um, what I just wanted to demonstrate is that there is still a heck of a lot of work to get through, um, and you can see how condensed that time frame is. So at the moment. We're in the working through the financials, the capital program, the operational expenditure. We're trying to figure out what our DC modeling is um, and other funding. So there's still a lot to pull together before we can get to the final numbers of rates requirements and things like that. So over the next couple of months, it's it's a big push to get through and refine the capital program, working through our OPEX, um, getting that all into the system and, and all that, that funding as well, so that we can actually start to talk about what those rates requirements look like at by the sometime in December, I would say. Um, there will be some finance 101s coming up over the next couple of weeks, um, looking at all our finance policies um, and also some work around our OPEX so that you can understand what's going into that, that pool, I suppose, as well. Um, the key important date that we are working towards is the 30th of January which is when we will need to adopt our financials and our consultation document for audit. Um, yeah, I suppose something that's glaring at everyone at the moment is the general election, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, given if there is a change of government, it is likely that things, things will change. Um, the sector is working really hard to understand what that might look like, so we will come back to you as soon as we have any sort of indication about what what that looks like and how it's going to impact our LTE mm -hmm. process. Um, just heard, yeah, sorry, um, you talk about January the 30th, and I know public sector pretty much shuts down December, January, but, and I, I, I totally appreciate that hardworking staff need to have um, leave and stuff, but do we need to come back a bit earlier? We, we have spoken about that. I um, we, that uh, this is so important, and I'm really conscious that like, you know, a I, few of us have been through this a couple of times, but but a lot haven't. So, yeah, no, I was a bit that. worried that. Um, oh, look, um, at risk and assurance, you know, we we really talked about these time yeah, pressures and things like that. Um, and I would say I've been I've been looking at this, trying to find any bits of time. I've tried to move a few reviews out so that we're not doing too much in one fortnight altogether. Um, I would say that this is something that we are reviewing quite frequently to make sure that we we, we are doing things earlier or we're moving things out if we can to relieve some pressure. So just another point there is, is we will communicate where we're having to move things. And I really appreciate at risk and assurance. Um, Anna yourself, you know, you said governance is here to help. So um, we we will be <laughs> leaning on you when, when we need to try and hit the timelines and deadlines. So um, thank you. Yeah, and, and through the chair, that, that's what I was alluding to. Like, I'm not worried about us. I'm worried about the operations side of the organisation because yeah. this is quite a weird it is. LTP. It's a super weird one. Let's just yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> thrown in with all this reform work that just keeps changing and, and big changes coming. Look, um, 
all I can say is that the staff here are doing an amazing job yeah. Yeah. behind yeah. me. Um, you know, they're not just but doing... We're all human. We are. All. We're all humans. And we're doing what we can. They're doing their business as usual on top of LTP. Um, so <laughs> we're really aware of how hard we're pushing. Um, I'm just lucky that people like me, I think. Andrew's going to try that Sorry, next week. The key balance is actually we're trying to allow people to have a break yeah. over that Christmas period and have some downtime. So ideally, if we can stick to that, mm -hmm. that would give people some time out. Okay. Because um, we know next year it's also going to be yeah. busy. And look, so this, this year, busy year. It's, it's not just LGP this year. We've had annual plan where we went out for book oh, consultation. Well. We've, had, we've had annual report. <laughs> Yes, there's an annual report still going. So we're well aware of everyone's capacity at the moment. And, and look, I'm not afraid to go and talk to our executive team and just say, hey, look, we we need to talk again. So I okay, that's all. I, I, I just care, that's all. Oh, I know you do. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and part of, um, I think, will determine on what happens post the election, um, because if there is a change from a sector perspective, and we have to do some drastic changes to you won't see anything back again, mm. which will be much more of a challenge for us for next next calendar year, if that's yeah. the time frame. But we are part of the part of the sector and planning on sort of running with the sector in terms of the direction. Um, and there's been a start of some sector conversations about what would happen if we don't receive uh, direction until early next year too. So. Uh, and through the chair, I would say that you probably won't like mm -hmm. coalition forms could take six weeks. So. Yeah. yeah, which makes preparing an LTP in the legislative timeframes almost impossible. Impossible, yeah. Okay. So um, <coughs> that, that's it from me. I just wanted to uh, let you know where we're at in the process. Mm -hmm. I know we had that big discussion at risk and assurance, but some of you aren't on that committee. Um, so, yes, I will hand over to Andrew, who will... So one of the important oh, things for today is... When we're not determining the CapEx program for today, you get more um, put in front of you as our, as our project plan to demonstrate that this is part of an ongoing series of workshops and series of conversations. So just, I know Andrew's going to touch on it more in terms of the purpose of today, but we wanted to take that picture about where we're at in the city of LTP. And today's not a, not a decision making day, it's uh, to give you some further information about the project. And I know Andrew's going to cover that off much better than I am. <laughs> Hey, just checking, John, uh, Councillor Williamson, can you hear us okay? I can, yeah, thank you. Thanks, David. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you hear us all right? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> thank you, Sonia. Okay, okay. okay. Andrew. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Kendall. I am going to use as few words as possible and try and be efficient with my voice and my time. I want to reassure you all that I sound not so good, but I, I, I did test myself this morning and it was very clearly negative, so I'm, I'm safe to be yes. <laughs> my goodness, there's quite, a, there's quite a cast of thousands behind us and you'll see, you'll see each of them in turn. Just in terms of the purpose of today is this is the purpose, in, in my point of view, that number one, so tell us which disc discretionary projects are must not. So yeah, we've adopted the terminology of must, could, will do. It's really good to, to have some must not as well. As uh, Julie mentioned, this isn't sort of the final decision, but it does really help us if if we get a good steer to say, hey, look, this thing really isn't a priority. It doesn't look like it's going to be really well supported, so put your effort elsewhere. So that would be quite useful. You're going to hear about the projects and the scope of a number of projects, selected projects. If you can give us any input that you think is really important strategically in terms of the direction of those projects, that would be really useful. If you give some strategic in input into the, the timing of those projects where that's optional, and you'll hear from each asset manager, project owner about where that is an option, that would be useful. And if there is anything material that's grossly missing from here, then it would be good to get some sort of heads up, although there have been other opportunities for that. Um, I don't want to be unhelpful. Um, I get the process that you're putting in front of us. And I know there is a stage where we look at the dollars. And the conversation we have had a little bit is around um, how do we, we know that CapEx is necessarily the biggest driver in terms of um, rates. 
but it has got interest on those loans and they are a bit more these days. And so it kind of is, how do we get a bit more discerning? So rather than just saying, oh, you know, because mm -hmm. we're going to, unfortunately, we do have a few, we naturally have some bites. So if I'm looking after two dangy, then I'm going to want to look at two dangy projects. Mm -hmm. But overall, Are you now? overall, Second bias, but the, <laughs> overall, um, we're wanting to to have just the a little bit more of the have to have, um, a little bit less of the other stuff. Um, overall, to yeah. to to do that contribution. I know we're today with just capex, but um, that's more helpful for me yeah. rather than you know. That one, that one, ooh, no, I agree. Yeah, that one. Hundred percent. You know, um, if it's so it's a little bit more the harder stuff. So that just uh, oh, look, councillor, councillor Lofton, I I totally understand you, and I, I, I might defer to the CE because what I've been asked to do is really talk about the capex program. I don't think we're we're there yet in terms of the overall cost and impact on rates, as Kevin was saying. So but so I think yeah, it's how it's all works and what's happening in the background. And it is, this is going to be a bit of a warts and all workshop to tell you where we're at as a team in terms of preparing stuff. So. Um, so where we're at in terms of the OPEX is the awesome team people are putting the OPEX budgets into what we have a system called IBIS at the moment. They've got a deadline to do that next week, and then we'll be able to start sort of doing very similar to what we've been doing to the CapEx program of OPEX costs. And then we expect to probably bring those to you late October. So, so we're running a CapEx program at the moment, and then OPEX will catch up. And then between the end of October through to December, we'll be looking at our overall budget and financial situation and funding because the other one we haven't got in here today is around how these projects would be funded and what that looks like so 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 bear with us we're trying to be as transparent and bring you on the journey as we can but um you know it is a long process to work through and so you know, we are showing you where we're at in terms of our mm -hmm. which is quite normal in terms of the LTP development and and we will have the opportunity to look at specific dollars of specific projects, certainly at, at a high level today. So yeah. we'll see that. Okay, so those are the objectives. Well, can I just throw one one blunt question to add to Danny's? Just the one. Little steel. You know, so, okay, so, so on, we're looking at sort of 80 million a year capital expenditure, roughly. Roughly 70, uh, yeah. So, yeah, well, I've got some nice graphs, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but just general, general. So, 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 for example, if we said no, keep it to 50, no, 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 keep it to 50, mm. what can you do with that? So, is that, is that, is that going to be sending us backwards in terms of long term expenditure and the renewal is going to be that much more expensive because we've left stuff too long? I can't answer that question. Can I answer that with the use of my graphs in a minute? Because yeah. I think that will help to understand what the options are. Okay, so before I get, yeah. before I get to my graphs, uh, this is the agenda, so I'm only going to speak for a short time and set some baselines of what the program looks like. Then I've got a couple of sure. scenarios that I modeled last night to see what, sure. what things might look like as an alternative. Sure. But the bulk of today is going to be on, on item sure. three, where we talk yeah. through the projects so that are on the list so you can understand them in detail and look at the merits and give us some feedback as per the purpose of the workshop. If we get some really good steers out of that, then while you're while you're having lunch, I can try and update the profile so that after lunch we can look at what sort of sort of read profile looks like, depending on how clear a direction we get. So and then and then hopefully we walk away from that with a bit more of a consensus, acknowledging of course that the OPEX and the overall costs are yet to be Okay. So this is the baseline program that's a build up of the asset management plans and projects that, that we've heard from in the community. Okay, so just keep that sort of profile in mind. That's that's without any, any adjustments that have been made to date. This is the natural order of when projects will land in these categories. And I'll point out to you some some of the some of the key ones. So blue, so blue, yeah, oh, you can. 
Okay, so blue is water, drinking water. You can see there's a larger expenditure at the start to catch up with some of our drinking water standards projects. Then you can see green is transport, orange is wastewater, yellow is venues, and, you, and red is the investments. I think it's useful for this purpose that we actually look at it without the investments because the investments sort of have their own business case and in terms of, of funding, they probably need to look at them on their own. So I've taken the investments out firstly so you can see what it looks like. So as you can see, 80 million in the first year and then you know some sort of seasonality, some sort of variation across the years going ahead. Helping you understand what's driving all that. So you've got quite a large spend in this profile on year three, which has got major expenditure for track, Owen Delaney Park, and what, what is, is the working title of Tech Fourth Court, but acknowledging that there's some opportunity to, to rescope and reshape that. Right, we've also got quite a significant expenditure for Northern Access of the second bridge stretching across those two years. That's contributing significantly to the large transport capex in those, those years. We've got alternative disposal for the Turingi wastewater treatment solution in those years, and then a large Mangikina wastewater treatment. Obviously, I'm not calling out every single project, but these are, these are ones that really shift what would be a baseline. Um, so just to the chair, with the Turangi uh, wastewater disposal, like we've been talking about this for years, and yep. I appreciate that Councillor Williamson is online. I'm just wondering why it's so far out, and is that acceptable to WRC in the consent conditions? We're going to cover that in the confidential part of the workshop. That's one of the projects we're mm -hmm. highlighted to discuss in a bit more detail. What you're also seeing is... Over three years there, quite a large expenditure for the northern, so north side of the Waikato River wastewater solution. And we'll, that's another project that we're talking about in the, in the confidential section. And then you can see some large expenditure for the museum at the back end of the, of the LTP time horizon. So that gives you a bit of a feel of an image of what's driving some of the, the peakiness of this. And I thought this is a, probably a good time to pause and talk about Councillor Campbell's question about what might happen if we were to reduce this down to say $50 million, which is around there. So you can see in this in this year, there's there's very little there's very little discretionary activity that that pushes us between 50 and, and where we are. So what we then start to look at is well you'd be directing us to to remove some wastewater or some some water treatment plants because there's a large expenditure Which there. Legally, we must do. So there are implications. Yep. That's right. There are implications for doing that, but but well, that's not a decision that that I think we'd be making. We'd be asking you to direct us on, to do that. So we could do that. We could reduce our renewal expenditure, both in wastewater, yes. transport, and water. Those are the big drivers there. There's a little bit in in property. I think it's about four million, if I remember that that number correctly. Uh, and then there's a there's a bit in 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 parks, uh, quite a lot of which is erosion control and measures like that. So we could look at that, and and we we then have to be eating into things that that are going to have a long term longer term impact. So I, I believe I can answer that question from a massage the numbers around and tell you the implications. I don't know, and I'm looking to Julie to tell us in terms of process what risk that buys us further down the track. So I can make that transparent to you. I, yeah, I'm uncertain how we deal with that. Um, through the chair, I would have thought that if you went with like Councillor Campbell's thing where you go, oh, 50 million, what can you do in that time, that we're going to end up in a really bad situation. Like we saw what one year of a rates remission did yeah. and the catch up we've had to play. You imagine what yeah. a, a a cap on yeah. that. If you put in all the stuff you had to do legislation wise, yeah. then we'd be doing nothing on roads or. Yeah. Oh, and things. look through the chair, some of the expenditure you're seeing in roads here is to catch up on not yeah, enough exactly. done in the past. So we're kind of a little Hindsight. kind of behind already. Yeah. And that's that's one of the that's one of the drivers of the baseline amounts that you mm -hmm. see here in terms of renewals. So through the chair, I mean. <laughs> 
you, you can't just say we, we have to, have to, have to. I mean, um, legislation, legislation. I mean, there'd be, there'd be councils out there which just can't do a lot of this stuff we're doing. And and the world doesn't end. I mean, it's not, it's like, not yeah. I mean, I mean uh, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's like, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that's the easiest way forward is to acknowledge this is what it looks like now. We're going to have a chance to talk about the projects and the key drivers. A number of those are, my view, um, pretty high in terms of priority because of the risk that you'd be buying as an organisation if you didn't achieve those. So um, we do get a chance to go through each of them. Sure. Okay. So again, just give you that. Got enough. Just the one. So it's going to be unhelpful. So just remind us. So. This is a long-term plan. In theory, the next council will be doing a long-term plan. So in terms of the stuff that's out, you know, in year, you know, four, eight, nine, and ten. Um, while if we're putting a plan out there, it should be, you know, a real plan. On the other hand, uh, some of it is a, to a certain extent just provisioning. If that makes sense. No. So. Um, Yes, we'd be reviewing the LTP every three years, so there'd be a chance to 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 do a check, I guess, to make sure that they're right. What I would say, though, is some of those projects, and that's where I, you know we're part of the process we're at, is we haven't looked at funding. Some of those ones are out further, the drivers are growth. They will have an influence on the development contributions. So, so there's a, there's a whole lot of work for us to go through. Today is just a chance to kind of dive into that next level of detail on the capex, and then of course we'll be setting up. And through the chair, like after what happened in Kaipara, you have to have a 30 year infrastructure strategy now. So, the community asset plan that sit under that. Mm -hmm. So, the 10 year projection sort of works in favour of that 30 year yeah. strategy. Well, I sort of, I've got one more slide before I start handing over to, to the team. So, just keep that in mind. That's the base profile. This is what I call, I've called a, a pessimistic delivery profile, which, well, I'm glad. yeah, so this is what I call a pessimistic delivery profile. And what it does is it actually smooths out the overall expenditure, sort of not coincidentally, but perhaps there's a bit of science to it. So just to explain how, how we got there, so we've reduced the venue spending in that year by shifting out the, the OD Park, sorry, shifting out the <coughs> fourth court activity out to here so that's that's one option <clears throat> I've, I've kept AD park there because it's tied to government funding etc and this also indicates a two-year shift in the in the bulk spend of the northern access which is also fairly fairly probable um, so that that remains in that year that remains in that year and the northern wastewater solution remains in that year the museum remains there but th this is I call it a pessimistic delivery profile, but this is something that we could well end up with through factors outside of our control, which, as you see then, over the 10 years, pretty much keeps us very close to 80 million, actually below that for pretty much every year. But through the chair, in terms of delivery, mm -hmm. is this pessimistic or is this stable or about right? <laughs> Uh, this is definitely from an operational perspective. Like, and I know you haven't done the numbers, but yeah, and I'm not interested in that. I'm just worried about deliverability because yeah. So, so there's a. Can I can I come back to that at the end? Certainly. <laughs> Let's go through the projects because okay. I'm just aware that the, the, the teams are here, but I, I I have absolutely considered that, and I've got some commentary on that. Oh. Okay, and I'll oh, just through the chair. I mean, if, if now's the time to comment on those projects, does it? Or that later? Probably I think we're going to gonna do the projects now, one by one, and so maybe that's that's the time to oh. to discuss them. So with that, I might hand over, and you're you're going to run the schedule. I'm not sure who's who's up to next. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Who's up next? Yes. So what we get, what you're going to have is you're going to have individual asset managers come up, but lurking in the background is Dennis Lewis, who you all thought had disappeared, but he hasn't because I've kept him on. 
Ghost to bring Mountain. us all of the, the the wisdom and experience from previous LTPs, and I'm I'm expecting Dennis to chip in with all of the the wisdom and experience that I don't have uh, when it comes to executing LTPs. So Dennis is here, and he'll jump in whenever I say something extraordinarily foolish, only extraordinarily foolish. Cool. Yeah. Stephen, Stephen, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the side seat there. Can I ask a, a processing question? Because roughly how many projects are we going to get through today? Um, we're going to try and stick to about five minutes per project, yeah. um, and, and mainly so that you have time to ask questions and you can get the details that you want. Um, I'll be trying to take notes, and, and, and it has been recorded, so if we can't come back to you with a specific question, we will make sure that it's noted and that we go away and, and get that back to you. Okay. I just make you know be with the days, so we just yeah. have to, <laughs> uh, we just have to kind of, kind of keep some of those key questions that Andrew raised and note that if there's some that we need to come back to, that will arrange a time to come back. Would be just yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and just Sorry. to note, at about eleven thirty, we will go into confidence. There are three projects just with commercial sensitivity around them that we need to, to talk about. Um, but otherwise, Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kendall. Uh, thank you, elected members, uh, Mia. Um, uh, Pete and I are here. So, first project um, to discuss this morning, LTP Project 1, uh, to the event centre or the track, as, as is known, um, conscious of the five minutes. So, um, just really want to bring you a, a quick cover off of the last couple of years and where we are at the moment. Um, there is a placeholder in the, in the current LTP of uh, about 15.9 million for the funding of a an event centre down in Turangi. Um, we have spent some of that money to date uh, working with consultants to come up with a concept and feasibility study of that property, of which we have shared with you in, in August, previous elected group um, back in August, um, where we landed in that space. And at that stage, um, the, the concept and, and the dollar workings indicated a facility that we, we wouldn't have the funds to, to, to build. Um, about a two and a half thousand square metre facility around um, 17, 18 million, excluding um, some work around demol uh, dem demolition of buildings down there and reinstatement down there. Um, conscious of uh, the co-governance agreement, the Manapopopono agreement, the new community board, um, there was a period of due diligence entered into and discussions with them at the back end of last year around reconfirming um, the direction and assumptions that had been made previously. And there has been changes in that directions and those assumptions. One being that um, there has been interest to go and speak with landowners in the town centre down in Tūrangi about the prospect of building something mm -hmm. over top of existing currently vacant buildings. Um, also, it was an opportunity that if um, a budget of 15.9 minus what's been spent to date, so about 15.6 left, could we build something and still honour the um, the demand and the desire from the community down there of why we are doing this? So the key reasons why are centred around youth, economics and social, social and cultural aspects of a facility down there. So working with um, the consultant, um, and also with uh, Ngāti Tūrangi Tukua and conversations with Tūwhari Toa, verbal acceptance that we can engage with landowners down there to understand what a facility in the town centre could look like and perhaps help with revitalisation of that space. Um, also, through an operational lens and very conscious that this hasn't gone back to the community board as yet, um, but actually looking at what a revised um, facility down in Tūrangi could be keeping within the $15.9 million budget. And I think we're, we're quite excited to um, work with the consultants that there is an option, a, a conceptual option, um, a slightly over 2,000 square metre option that meets indoor court space and community space um, options for the community down there um, that could be built within that $15.6 million budget and I, I do emphasize that as a concept at this stage um, but we have got that workings um, the next stage in that work is overlaying footprints down in Tūrangi using in essence three options Tikapur Park is the first option um, for both a, a over budget option a within budget option 
And then a third option is looking at a town centre and understanding what we could potentially do in that space. Uh, the, the steps forward from here is obviously we have a little bit more work to do um, to get those concepts um, laid out. Uh, but interesting, and we're having a conversation with the community board, our Hapu partners, and ultimately leading to a point within public consultation through this process where we feel we can put um, a couple of viable options in front of the community for them to decide on a way forward. And as Andrew's mentioned in his slides, at the moment, funding sits within the first three years of the LTP. So just to you, when you mention community board, are you talking about the Manapapahono or Tongariro rep group? Or both. Talking about the co-governance committee. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll the chair. Just a, just a question. Uh, sponsorship has come up before, actually. Like Genesis, like for example, in Westport, the, you know, the coal companies down there put stacks of money into big swimming pool complex, stuff like that. Is, is that is so third party investment, private sponsorship, absolutely. Yes, uh, that has been considered. Um, Working with a consultant at the moment, it's more to come up with what a project we feel we can deliver. And then with that and with a why and a steer, then those conversations mm -hmm. are Oh, so it's, yeah, rather than just go them go to Genesis and ask for five million dollars or something. Yeah, and I think look, that's an option. I think the challenge in that is I'd probably turn around and say, Well, what are you building? Yeah, yeah. And we're not quite there yet, Andrew. Yeah. Um, with a nine point two increase in rates, why is there not a nine increase on the cost of this building? Uh, so, so there has been cost escalations in this building and there is a, I don't want to use the word reduced option, but there is an option that fits within the budget. But I'm asking yeah. you, why are you sticking to that budget when two ringy ratepayers have all had a big increase in their rates? Well, through the chair, I'd assume like that some of that increase would actually have to go to other projects as well. It's not specifically. I'm asking you. Um, I just think that if you're sticking to a budget that was put in place three years ago and we've had a rate increase and people in Turing have paid a large rate increase, I'd be expecting you to take that into account and actually have an increased budget for this project. So perhaps I'll leave that with you as a question that you might like to come back to me on. Um, sure. Through the Chair, can I just say that revaluations were a central government legislated thing. It's not a council legislated thing. And also, I think going to a district-wide rating base was extremely generous of the majority of ratepayers considering an $80,000 spec was a 1% rate increase in the Turangi ward. So there's a question that I'm asking to start from. When you look at the rate increase, particularly across the district down there, people have actually had, many of them have had far more than a 9.2 increase. And you're sticking to a budget that was put in place three years ago and saying that we're going to get reduced facilities because the budget, you're going to stick so firmly to the budget. So, so if so there's been an increase in costs, why is that not being credited to this budget? Yeah, to, the, to this project. To this project. So, so I'm going to answer the part in two So councillors, it's your decision around the scope of this project. If you wish to take an option where the scope increases, and that would logically increase the cost of the project. The rates revaluation of where those rates fall across the district is quite separate. Um, I would also point out that Mangakino has had quite an increase in the last revaluation too. So I totally understand your point. I think it's a little bit hard to answer it from Pete and Steve's perspective, but I do think they're actually two different issues. I understand what you're saying, um, but I do think we probably just need to keep that across the whole district too. We're going to take that approach. Thank you, Pete. Okay, thanks, Steve. Thank you, Pete. Nothing else? All good? Thank you. At least the project is still alive. So far. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, it's kind of been what you're saying, but it was the that was the figure that was in the previous budget. So, so, um, well, my argument is that I have seen projects around here, but if you had increased costs on them, and it's been very easy for council to approve those costs, I'm thinking of your 
more of my project for really as other things, it's a real need increase costs. Um, and I think that probably is something that too many people would expect you to even look at going forward. If you're talking about a reduced facility, because you're sticking very closely to a budget. So that's all I've got to say on it. I think there's probably some more conversations to be had about this one. So, so there's probably an opportunity to have a feedback on the scope of the project at a certain time, and that might then align with the feedback that you've raised around the yeah. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Pete. Um, Next, off stage. You're 16. Oh, um, so we've got two more projects to talk about, um, one being the fourth court and floor of here at the, the um, AC Event Centre and the Owen Delaney Park grade. So, thank you. Um, on. Uh, so the, the second project, um, obviously project number three, uh, so touring the event centre, the additionality of the fourth court and also acknowledging uh, the work that's required at the moment to understand um, whether there is some substructure for repair work needed up there. Um, uh, Andrew, in his um, slides earlier, uh, indicated this is a potential project to move out to, to year five. Um, Sorry, the pessimistic uh, model uh, moved out to U5. So there is a, a $9.5 million placeholder uh, proposed uh, for this piece of work. Um, Got the property team uh, are here. So currently we're undertaking some analysis and investigative work around some uh, substructure slumping um, under court two within the event centre um, and whether or not there is any connection to some repairs work that have held in the West car park recently in that space. Uh, so the engineers are doing that piece of work and we were within sort of a week. Yeah, so we should have a report back uh, by the end of this week around uh, floor length and that's viability. And then the works around the Western car park is geotech work to understand suitability of using that car park for the extension of the fourth court. Um, the business case has been written with a fourth court being attached to the end of the existing Total Event Centre over the Western Car Park. It would involve the relocation of the commercial rock wall that we operate in there and a benefit to the community in that space would ultimately allow the rock wall to have its own separate entrance and operate um, uninterrupted by the current use of the indoor court facilities. Um, we have a closure of the rock wall currently of 150 days a year because of the overlay on the current court three. We are aware, councillors are aware that um, the squash club, the total squash club, have put a, a concept in front of you as a group during the last annual plan consultation with an indication that they'd like to build a purpose built facility across the road, across AC Vards Ave, which in their concept includes a fourth court. And, and I guess this is where we have an opportunity to rescope the work around the Topo Event Centre fourth court option and possibly going to be driven a little bit by the, the geotech reports we're going to get shortly is whether or not the fourth court needs to physically be on the Topo Event Centre location or could be incorporated into supporting the squash club's idea across the road. Um, just through the chair, if um, oh, I really like the racket sports mm. have brought forward because it shows complete partnership yeah. and people who get off their butt and actually start doing stuff for themselves goes a long way. So um, in, have we got any scope in the plan for where that might possibly be put? I know they had a, a site in Hickling Park where probably hockey would probably not be happy with, but it, have we have have we got I suppose it's more OPEX question, but um, no, no, some it's, it's work a... around how we might work with them and where it might go and a co-funding option as opposed to 9.5 for this yep. in year five. Yep. Uh, there's a piece of work to do with our, our property and, and probably legal team in that space. Yeah. The actual the possible location would be where the AC bars print their buildings exist at the moment with a series of community leases that are operating on right. that site. Um, when did the leases run out? They've all been aligned, haven't they? Yeah, I think so. Just looking at some think it's Sorry, through the chair, mm. I understood that they'd identified a space and the only building that would be affected was Harriet's. 
Okay, so it's the one. And, the, and Harry's are keen to join up with yeah. them and use the facility. So, it, but but it's still a work in progress. Yeah, I think the leases have got a couple of years to run. They have been. But no, um, I can find that out for you. Okay. So, I think if we, sorry, through the chair, if we can grasp mm -hmm. partnership and show communities that we want to be on board with okay. others and take options forward where things are funded, not by ratepayers, but other means is an awesome thing to do. Cool. So we yeah. can take, so if it was a steer from the elected group that, um, you know, the partnership option working with a... Um, yeah, I, you know, we've got one existing facility, we have a bed center, yep. ticketing operations at ingress and egress and all that sort of thing. You know, we're too short for a international netball game. So, you know, we've got to look at this very closely. And you know, then we go to a separate venue, which is, you know, which is you know, good, but should we have upgraded our facility to make it international? So, I'd like to see a bit more. Yeah. Can I suggest you do it this way that you, like, within the business case, you accommodate options to include all other partners there, keep it broad so you're not ruling anything in or out, mm -hmm. and then leave it at that. Cool. Yeah, I'd be interested in that GEO tech when it comes back, uh, Scotty. Cool. Yeah. Has that just been? No, we, we started this work um, about three or four months ago. Okay. Um, we got the engineers in to bid on the front of the building since construction. A bit of a time over there, which was quite interesting. We just split down the west car park with the three plates and everything. So we're getting a full report on what we start happening. We're yeah. actually probably going to wait for what should be today or early next week. Cool. So this is exactly the sort of input. So we've got some input on scope. The question I had for you explicitly was timing, because you could see in in the original baseline, this landed in the same year we were doing quite a large expenditure in venues at both OD Park and Track. And to Councillor Park's question, that's where I start to have deliver deliverability concerns. Okay. So the direction, which I don't want to presuppose what you're going to say, but if you've got some direction on timing for this one, that would help feed into that okay. answer around which how we do it. And the baseline is it's planned it's because all of these are built up from from base requirements they all happen to have it in year three so the question is if you want to look at those three and say well which one of those can be shifted the way i look at it this is possibly the only one that's up to you if, if you if you say you absolutely have to do them all in year three that's fine i can take that away and try and look at them. and through the chair i think it, it, it public private partnership option is about when they get funding and stuff as well. So it's a little bit out of council. So you want to push it out a bit, Steve? No, push out the portfolio from the events center. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's the question. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we've got yeah, one. Forward. We've got the OD Park upgrade yeah. to talk about next. So perhaps the timing thing to Andrew's point is those are the three projects he's talking about. To only event centre, Owned plan, only Owned only park upgrade, total event centre fourth court, and I think your timing question maybe you will give us a steer once Travis and I finish talking about this project. I think that's that's the direction we're looking for at that point. Because yeah, we will struggle to deliver those three. Yeah, four then. Yeah, five. Five is is probably a good good target. Very good. Hey, Owen Delaney. Good morning, Travis. Morning, Mayor and Council. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. Good morning, Travis. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. Cool. Um, sorry, I'll just change over to the laptop. Cool. Um, Owen Delaney, uh, Owen Delaney Park <coughs> uh, upgrade, um, which is tied into the uh, government fund of the better off funding 4.93 million that is a, a group of councillors um you have uh, applied for and we were fortunate enough to receive so um, we've received 4.9 million of that central government funding um to do seismic and part of that funding was to do seismic assessment um, work out there at the grandstand and function room um, as well as developing a master plan for iron delaney park moving forward 
Um, in addition, there is circa 3.5 million in the annual plan, again, um, uh, confirmed by previous elected members, um, to upgrade facilities such as the changing rooms, the lights, stadium lights, PA system, school board, and entranceway. We have, and I guess I'm conscious of the five minutes we've got today, we can spend three hours talking about this project alone. We have a workshop with you next week. So if you, at the end of this, you're going to feel a lot on information. I just want to acknowledge the fact that we do have a workshop with you next week where um, some of the consultants' concepts will be put in front of you and discussed in more detail. Um, we have some priorities and they are tied to our funding. Um, and those priorities remain around reducing the seismic risk to the facility out there. Um, we need to get changing rooms up to current standards. We need to improve our ability to host larger events, which is both changing room and lighting. We want to reduce, reduce operational costs and increase the level of service. We've undertaken feedback and, and consultation uh, through with the community through the recreation and sport strategy. Um, and more specifically around this project, we've engaged with the key user groups out at Owen Delaney Park to better understand their um, aspirations. Strategy, does that include cricket? Yes. Uh, they had every user um, had the opportunity to submit feedback. I'm going to say we had about a 30% 30, 30 response, but the consultants, so yes, Smith and Exist have worked um, with those communities, and yes, there was definitely feedback provided through through Cricket. Yes. Yeah. Um, the 4.93 million from central government funding is not sufficient to cover the seismic strengthening work as we understand it that would need to be done to the facility. And when you uh, combine that with the 3.5 in the annual plan, even then, um, because a number of those projects are inter interdependent upon one another, um, we, we wouldn't be able to address um, everything in one hit. So there is a $9.5 million request of placeholder in the LTP over the first three years to support that circa $8 million funding that we have there. And collectively, that gives us the opportunity to deliver um, outcomes of uh, removing the seismic risk from the building, upgrading change facilities, um, providing new corporate area function space, which can turn, in turn provide commercial revenue, um, an upgraded lighting plan um, with, some, uh, with the PA system and school board attached. School board. There is a, a much bigger piece running as well, which we've used the opportunity to talk about a 50-year master plan for the site. Uh, and that extends out in taking the feedback from the community and from regular users, starts looking at investment into a, um, they're calling it a, a, a heart. So they're actually using, in the one hand, Timata Funa's new facility in Turangi as a bit of a benchmark or an understanding of how a community space can be utilised by a wide ranging group. So the master plan brings in a concept facility not dissimilar to Timatapuna with community space and change room space. It brings in um, upgrades to the netball ports. The additionality of some covered netball ports is some form of roofing structure. Um, it brings in also um, the inclusion of indoor training facilities, not an indoor court. So not a fourth court at the event centre, um, but for the purposes, it'll be a hard floor um, to sort of more manage uh, those groups that don't need to play competitive sport on a, on a timber stadium court. I, I guess if I'm looking for an example, and please don't pigeonhole us here, but a concrete floor with a, a turf overlay, which could be used for indoor cricket, bowling practice to the marching ladies to... A, a band to, you know, a marching band to do their thing or whatever that is. So not a sprung wooden floor in the concept of a stadium. And just to add to that, Steve, because I've, I've thought about that, that space quite a bit and the importance of it, because it's not just it's not just the people who need to compete. It's a training facility undercover. So if the netball can't train for whatever reason or there's not enough undercover, they can go up there. If uh, the rugby 
need to train. They can, yeah. Anyone can go in there and use that space undercover, and it's a nice big space. So that will still alleviate, you know, the court space issue at the event yeah. centre. So that is that that sort of widens out uh, the, the community piece and, and brings in the concept of a master plan for on Delaney Park. Uh, as I say, there is a workshop with you next week. Um, Travis has done an, an awesome job from a project side with the consultants to, um, I guess, firstly, drill down and distill down what, what it is the community wants out there um, and, and not dissimilar from the Turangi Event Centre, taking that feedback and then coming up with some options of which a number of have been removed um, already um, to land on what is a couple of concepts moving forward. But the, the big piece of this work and, and to do with the long-term plan and how you stage and fund this is the requirement for this additionality or this this 9.5 million to be added in there to achieve those initial upgrades, but ultimately being driven around the seismic risk to Owen Delaney Park. Um, just through the chair, given um, what's happened with the uh, current and also the Global Games and every other major tournament that we have, I see this as an absolute priority. The fact that we're the largest population base in our district, but Turangi and Mankikino have better sporting facilities than the, where the major population is, this to me is ASAP, not year three. I've only just got to be fair. Oh, yes, to be fair, but I mean, those changing rooms look like scenes out of a US prison. Yeah. Just the, the comment on the staging, and again, we're working through this as, as part of the master plan of staging with uh, trying to address the most of the priorities as we can with the, with the money we currently have, hence uh, this request. But the staging of the better off funding uh, goes through until June 2026. So we've got a little bit of time to deliver it. So we're trying to be smart about how we deliver. But that, that's why we have the request in the first bit of the LTP, because there is a risk that if we if we don't address all the seismic and upgrades, which is specifically mentioned in the better off application, then we have to apply uh, for an amendment of uh, scope of that. And so, and we have deadlines on when we have to spend the money, which is why money has been put in when the money has been put in. Okay. And from an emergency management perspective, with that head on, it, it's a no brainer. All right. Okay, we'll look forward to the next week. Overrate those plans in detail. Oh, look, what the pop up guy says is from a deliverability perspective, if you're doing some work on Podi Park, it makes no sense to go away and come back two years later and do it. So it mm -hmm. makes perfect sense to do it all at the same time. Yes, thanks. All right, it's still me. Yep, that's all yeah. you. No, no, I've oh. got one more. Oh, oh, oh. Louisa. Um, we've got the uh, museum and, um, oh. upgrade. Okay. Proposal um, to discuss with you as well, yeah. please. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm hogging the hogging the talking You've stuff at the moment. Whole project, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, so so the final project to discuss with you guys today, and this has been um, earmarked for years uh, nine and ten of the current LTP, is a proposal to upgrade the museum facility. Something that's been uh, through previous LTPs, um, and uh, I think. Councillor Williamson's online um, will attest to, to some of the work that uh, the arts community have done to try and progress this piece of work. Um, ultimately, why years nine and ten? Um, we have, and thank you for Councillor for accepting the uh, Arts, Culture and Ngātoi Action Plan earlier this year. Within that document, there were 37 actions. Uh, this is one of those 37 actions. And when we've gone back round to the arts community post uh, that document being accepted and having conversations with them, there we there are some priorities or some low hanging fruit, for lack of a better word, that the community, the arts community, want us to work on, namely um, resource help for them um, and a lot of marketing and exposure um, support for them in that space um, through the community engagement team. Pete Boyd has been doing some wonderful work with them in that space about us how you understand their longer-term aspirations. Um, we've met with a number of the different clubs 
who are working out of um, siloed buildings and facilities. Um, there is certainly a lot of verbal support for hubbing as a concept. Um, we still have a lot more work to do in that space. So the building of a museum, um, while needed, um, the, the, the building, the existing building is about 50 years old um, and, and really has only had incremental increases over that period of time while something is needed. Um, that is very much something we are eyeing for the, the final three years of this existing LTP. Also acknowledging that there is a significant piece of work to do with our EWI partners in this space. We've had verbal conversations with um, Te Whare Taua and uh, Nati Tūrangi Tukua in that space. Um, and there are certainly aspirations from their side to have something built the southern end of the lake. And ultimately, from us in a planning and a, and a concept place, that, that has to remain an option. And I guess being open, as Councillor Taylor and Councillor Campbell indicated about being open to all sorts of outcomes, perhaps a, a new museum could be built in two parts at both ends of the lake, for example, as opposed to a purpose-built building up here. We'd like to enact other sections of the action plan and no toy plan initially. Um, and I think that will give us great steer and guidance in what a new facility would look like come the back end of this LTP. I've got a question from uh, Councillor Williamson. Come in, John. Yeah, yeah thanks, Your Worship. Not so much a question. Um, um, yes. You have to turn the volume up there. Just supporting. Um, so you can hear me? It's not on mute. It's not speaker. Well, I'm not on mute. Stand by, John. We can't hear you yet. I'm on. I'm on. I'm on mute. Oh, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yep. We're not speaking. That's as long. as as loud as it goes. Yeah. Um, John, can you turn your volume up? Hear me now. Write it and hold the paper up for the screen. Can't hear me. Put a button check. I can hear John. We can't hear Karen either, so it's best to see John. Oh. I can hear Karen. My chick. Can yeah, Karen. you can hear me? Yeah, and no, I can hear you, John. Yeah. Hi, Karen. Hey, John. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just talk to ourselves for the next hour and a half. We can solve the we can solve the cap Just make Karen now and you'll get back to us. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm trying yeah, to put John. Yeah, I can't do yeah, yeah. it. Okay, you did my question. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, you both calling. Turn off if you want others to hear. Okay, you're now. I'll just ring Karen. Tell John to Lucky you've got two phones, Rachel. I know. Oh, lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Erin here. Is someone, uh, um, the people online can hear Councillor Williamson no, fine, so it must be something with the speaker there. That would change. Well, I can hear everything. Chain okay, we'll just get hey. um, yeah. Could you tell John to answer his phone and I'll do it on speaker so we can hear him? Oh, yeah. We can't. He can't. <laughs> yeah, we can hear. We, uh, so I can hear him through the. Yeah, we can hear you. And we can hear you guys as well. So if you communicate the message through your end, we can hear you. Okay, so I'll call John that little bit now. Connection. He'll call you. Okay. Hi, right, John. You're on the speaker phone. Go. Well, ask your question. Oh, okay. Um, did you have a question? Supporting Steve's comments regarding the wedding event. Well, Coco. Oh, you can hear stuff. Meet us, John. It's working not well. Yeah, we can. We can hear you. But there is an echo because we actually, you turn your speaker down. No, that might be. And then just talk into your phone.
catch you later on. Bye. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Yeah. So the biggest question yeah. is that yeah. IT are on their way. So there you go. A lot more conversation on this. Topic. Very much so. Yeah. so. So again, if it comes back to, I think Andrew's shaping and um, what today it's around scope and timing. Yeah. Um, we've we've um, proposed this to be a project in the back end of this LTP. So if there was to be a change in that, um, then we'll need to change our, fo our focus and direction about what we're trying to achieve in the action plan space. And again, keeping in mind that the action plan, those 37 actions all had indicative timelines for us to deliver on. Uh, there was a significant number that the community were looking for us to achieve in the next couple of years. And we've following that prioritization to put this placeholder in years, not cool. 10. Thank you. Um, just, right. just through the chair, I know that, I mean, this is not to do with a, like, beautiful, big, multi-million dollar building, but what's the visitorship, the visitor numbers like for the museum? Are they consistent? Have they gone up? Well, they went down post-COVID. Yeah. And we're now starting to retrench that. Yeah, they are moving, moving back up. So they're in the mid-20s. Um, and that's, and we've seen that. The differences in the overseas tours. So they're starting to come back now, so we're starting to yeah, get back back. Cool. A relevant comment. Love the uh, radio um, information this today, inviting those young kids in to pick up the canvas and then yeah, 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 yeah. lovely community. Yeah. So we know that the community um, stuff really works for us. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Just a, um, so, so for, with a larger museum, or is, is, have you, have you got a, is there a bunch of stuff in the basement that you can't display or something? Is, is that part of it? Yeah. Yes, oh. we've got storage issues and yeah. a moratorium, basically, because we cannot um, take on that responsibility in your own storage. Oh, okay. And, and then the other thing is, um, <laughs> like, say, say Auckland Museum has these cabling sort of exhibitions that would that would be part of it too. Yeah, we receive yeah. drawing exhibitions, we actively seek them. Um, no, we've got, and we've got one in the spot now. Yeah. Yes. 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 The the current current is. Um, turning stuff away at the moment, are you? Or? Um, not so, deliberately. If no. it's a must have, we'll take it regardless yes. and find, find yeah. some option to look after it. Okay. But there's not only just receiving it, but there's, there's the ongoing care mm. and the fact that uh, donate, donors like to see the artifacts on display. So, you know, we've got to weigh all those things up. Yeah, quite a yeah. challenge. Yeah, it's a real challenge. Space. Yeah, cool. Thanks for listening. Good to see you. Thank you, Stephen. Cool. Thank you. Uh, right, moving on, Kendall, what have we got? Uh, we've got Bush, and we've got an IT request to restart. Oh, an IT request. For someone who's better at Teams know how to do that. Just hang up and reconnect. Sleep. Yep. Can you hear me? We have Tom and Tony. Tony and Tom. Can you hear me? Morning, morning. Any councillors? Can we just have a sound check, please? Apologies. We've got Councillor Williamson. Can you both hear us now? Oh, well, we could hear you the whole time. It was just a matter of you guys not being able to hear us. Okay, IT's on the way. All right, morning, gentlemen. Welcome. Morning, morning. Um, So, um, we've got uh, all three of the asset managers this morning, but before I go any further, I'd just like to introduce uh, we've got a stormwater asset manager now, Phil Burt, who's just people, I'm sure, stand up. Phil is new to uh, Topol, come from South uh, Waikato District Council, so he's our new stormwater asset manager, which is awesome. Welcome, Phil. Nice to see you. Um, so we've got obviously, uh, our, you know, various projects within the water space, and, and um, Tom has got all the detail around that. So we're just going to touch on a few kind of um, legislative projects and some. Keep talking. Okay, okay, I can do that. Legislative projects and obviously some bits and pieces that we want to put in um, the LTP. Um, so we've got a bit of a bit of detail around that. Here you go. <laughs> Okay, Tom, do you want to jump on the legislative? 
Um, yeah, so I think the first one on on the list that was I was given anyway was the Centennial Water Treatment Compliance Upgrade. So this is a um, seven and a half million dollar project to ultimately provide safe water for our Centennial scheme. Um, we've already got a roughly a million dollars, so I think there's about six million dollars in the in the LTP and use one and two. Um, basically, we've done a study over the last couple of years, and the way we're going to provide that water is by a connection to the TOPOR scheme. Um, we did look at a treatment plant out at Centennial, but it's about six, $6 million more. Um, and the OPEX is quite a lot more to run that plant as well. Um, yeah, so, so it's a pump station and a pipeline out to Centennial. It is, we have to do it. Um, in some way, shape, or form, um, and we really need to do it as soon as possible. So it's sort of been, it's it's one of a number of these that you'll see, and there's obviously a number underway as well. So that covers Rakanui. Yeah, the Rakanui Road area. Motorsport um, Park. Uh, no, that's already on the total scheme, oh, okay. but there is significant growth out of, out of, in that off that Rakanui Road area as well. So it's to service that growth as well. That's right. Yeah. 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 Thanks about 50 yeah. lots, I think. So it's almost yeah, doubling size. That's year one and two and, and current in the current year. Yeah. So it's sort of underway. What is the general question? Like um this sort of thing, development contributions that would yeah. pay pay for the whole thing, half of it? Um, some of it. So because it's a you know, it's something I guess that we should have done some time ago. Like it's a it's a level of service type project. Um, I guess the way the DC contributions work is it's it's only the the growth component. Yeah. They only fund sort of their proportion, whereas a lot of this project is for the existing people that are already there, the existing lots. So, um, but but for every lot that's created, there'll probably be about I would say about ten grand that the developer will contribute. So. Yeah, I was sort of looking at it this morning. It's probably at least half a million that will come from yeah. this. There's a new this um, new energy park they're putting in. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's not in the context of a seven million dollar project. It's not necessarily a lot. But. The lemon skip there. I'm sorry. Um, no, they take they take from us as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, Lemonix and Tinon are both serviced by this supply. Yes. So we've got a couple of supplies. We've got a raw supply up there as well as a potable supply. Raw supply versus the potable supply. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So when we need to look at DCs and attribute that to growth, presumably there was some growth. You can't retrospectively go back to that and calculate that in. That's right. Yeah. Once people are connected, it's too late to. Uh, All right. There was growth at some point, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's why it's so important to get the growth forecast in correct. Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, we've got a couple other projects that kind of follow the same vein, um, with then respective compliance upgrades. Yeah, look, I think I've been told not to talk about renewals, so I'm going to jump that one. Um, the next one, which might have a bit of discussion, is um, universal smart water metering. So. Um, this one is, and I, I'm not quite sure what, what you've all seen, but um, what I think you've seen is a budget for um, $11 million um, starting in year one of the LTP. So this is a, this is a um, six year program. So we've already sort of started. So we've already rolled out smart water meters um, on I think six of our small schemes sort of over the current LTP. We're not billing those meters, so we're using those as part of our water loss strategy to help um, us understand where the water's going. They've proven incredibly useful um, in finding leakage, um, and, and that's, you know, we've had a couple of instances already of that. The plan um, in the upcoming LTP is year one to three, we're rolling out meters um, at, on our existing rural schemes, upgrading to these smart meters, which allows it drastically reduces the meter reading time. And in um, years two and three, we're then gonna start um, rolling them out in Kinloch, Mangakino and Mochuopa. And then years four, five and six, that's when we're gonna go district wide. And by the end of year six, the plan is that we will build, start billing everybody for water. Um, the key driver for this is 
is really growth, but as well as all the other obvious benefits around water metering, which I, you know, I could go into, but I won't at this stage. But the one of the real benefits um, is that if if we do it by by year six, we've got some real potential to, um, I guess, reduce some of our capital budgets later in the camp. So we've got a whole lot of reservoirs that need renewing um, that are scheduled in another project. If we get these meters in, and, and you know that the evidence is pretty clear that you get a reduction in water use, right? You know, up to sort of 20, 30% potentially, whether we'll see that, we don't know. But then potentially a lot of those future projects, we can build the reservoir smaller for us. So we, we need to do this project, but technically not till sort of year 11. Um, we've started because it, it's the right thing to do and it really helps us from a kind of water demand management perspective. So we've started on our smaller schemes where if we have a leak, it has a huge impact. Um, we're planning to continue rolling out over the coming years. And as I say, my sort of my thinking is that over this three years, we can uh, communicate with the community, tell them like, this is what we're going to do. You know, in the next LTP, we're going to roll out district-wide meters and we're going to start billing for these reasons. Um, but in the meantime, we'll sort of take steps on that on that, that route. So, so it is a, you know, it is $11 million. It is a, it's a decent project and there's a lot of thinking to do there's quite a lot of business process work to do you know we will need more people it'll have a rating impact you know from a people perspective a metering impact there's all sorts of amazing things you can do with these meters you know you can have your your rubbish trucks can be going around picking up the meter readings as they pick up the rubbish you know that's what these smart meters can do um so there's lots of fancy things you know and i you know ultimately it's a great project but you know, technically, you can make the decision not to do it till, from a growth perspective, till outside this LT. But I wouldn't think. So we could talk a long time about water demand management, and it's pretty much um, at the core of what we do on a daily basis, uh, managing our networks more effectively. Uh, and with some of those rural schemes, we've actually upgraded those meters to the smart meters. So they they were up for renewal anyway. So we just we put in smart meters to enable that an easier um, process for our meter reader. Um, and we every every year we we do a water loss calculation as well, which uh, looks at um, the amount of water we're using across the district. And and clearly, first and foremost, you've got to get your own house in order. So and so, you know, it's linked in with like renewals. It's linked in with knowing where our water goes at all times through uh, DMAs, demand management zones, um, flow meters in the network, all those kind of things. So we've got you know we've, we've done a program of works getting all that up together, and now we're now looking at moving on into the next kind of phase of that. Um, like I said, we could we could talk a long time about demand management, but I'm sure there are a few questions. Cool. Okay. Um, for me, it's a it's a have to. We we have to do this. It's not a optional thing. Uh, we need to for a wide range of reasons. It's everything to do with um, water in the future and the whole Waikato River and all these officers trying to take water. It's about the so current loss rate of water through the pipes. It's currently it could vary scheme by scheme, but our worst ones are the likes of Two Rangi, where we're half of the water we produce, we lose. Half the water is bound into the soil. So these issues. And yeah, anyway, that's just just sharing, you know, you're asking for impact, we, we have to do this. It's not a if should I could or water. Through a lot of the public submissions, a lot of the people were talking about um, making people doing new builds, putting in a, a water tank. Mm -hmm. And is that part of the thinking? I mean, that, that one does come up, you're quite right. And I mean, it's always quite useful to have that. Um, and some of the challenges is then actually when you're in the middle of a drought, for instance, um, there's not a lot of water left in the water tank when you've used it for water in a garden or for using for other purposes. Uh, that, and I've, I've experienced that in the past and other places um, where you, when you need it, it's not there because you've used it all gone and there's no rain which should replenish it. But they are they are useful and handy, definitely. But I mean, that's that's not a requirement, I don't believe, through our building process at the moment. Certainly, so, some areas have. Okay, looking at doing mm -hmm. it, I wonder with the amount of building we've got going, and it needs the water gardens when you have got some water in the tank. Yeah, and of course, that's all about kind of education as well. So it is quite useful to, to use. We wouldn't advise it, though, eh? 
Patrick would incentivise people to have tea. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I totally agree with this. Like, water's our biggest asset, and I think that, you know, we've got a, lots of absentee uh, homeowners here as well, and they all look out and go, oh, what do you mean a water shortage? We've got this big blue puddle, whereas we've only got resource consent for that part of the big blue puddle. Um, but is the 11 million in year one, um, I mean, we don't no, know. Sorry, sorry, 11 million across six years. Six so, years, right. Yeah, okay, yeah. but I'm just wondering about the timing and deliverability aspect considering we don't know what we don't know about the 14th of October. And it could take, it'll take weeks based on current polling for coalition talks and all of that. So um, I'm just wondering whether we need to push it out a little just to see where that the three waters <laughs> lie. Or does it not matter because we'll get recapped? The three, four, five. So okay. it's a little bit up front, which is a design and a few steps, but the bulk of it is. It's very and it's very simple work. Um, so the yeah, the first few years is replacing existing meters yeah. initially. So that's you know down or will do that sort of bread and butter for them. Um, year two and three, we're looking we'll start rolling out into the likes of Kinloch, Mangikino, Mochuova. Mm -hmm. But you know over the last few years, we've done all the small schemes. It's not it's not difficult work. Um, so yeah, I think. And I don't really see how three waters would have any impact okay. on this. Okay, well, that's cool. Just asking the layman's question. This is recorded. Yeah. People were going to watch it and might ask. Mm -hmm. And I see that power companies are doing the same. Mm -hmm. Sandra. Thank you, Worship. Um, so Turangi's just gone through its uh, new pipes process all across the town. Everybody across the town has had new pipes and meters put in at present? Uh, no, no, Turangi, we've got significant um amounts of old very old pipe um we've been running renewal programs out there for you know forever um and um and we've got many more planned so there has been significant yeah, yeah, exactly. so yeah. what sort of percentage are we talking about that have actually got um smart uh, meters on their properties at present well, in, in two days yeah. in two days, days. Well, I, probably two percent so literally only the industrial areas and and businesses. Domestic mm -hmm. domestic public does no meters. All, the streets have all had all new pipes gone. Oh, manifolds, yes, but yeah, not manifold. meters. So you're not including meters when no. you redo the pipes? Only the manifold, which is which is um where you've got the facility to screw in a meter down the track. We're going to replace the Toby the, yes. at the boundary. We replace that when we would do pipe renewals. Mm -hmm. So we replace it with what we would refer to as a manifold. Mm -hmm. So therefore it's still a Toby, but we also have the facility to screw in a meter should be down the track. It's just it's just a rather than having to go back and redig it. Right. So um I know my house was built in ninety seven and I had a meter installed in mine. So I don't know what year you started um, doing it as a mandatory thing. What what year was it not mandatory? Yeah, it's not mandatory. It's not well how did it come I got one in the neck. Oh maybe we knew you. I thought I was using too much water. So you're saying you're fifty percent loss of water in Turangi, yeah. and you believe that this is an old pipes. Uh, what yeah, thinking? Yeah. Um, you don't think it's people just turning their taps on? Uh, it yeah. will be a combination. Yeah. So there will be a lot of private leakage in Turangi too, and that's what these meters will tell us. We've got plenty of examples of where we've experienced operational challenges, and we've been out doing um, leak detection and then found. Significant leaks on private pipes, so there's a huge problem with that. And of course, we can't tell, can we? There's no way of us telling other than, than we've got a meter and we go out and sort of check it. There's like there's no way that a resident can support you in your work at present. Just by repairing leaks if they've got dropping yeah. taps and that sort of thing. But yeah. you know, but there are challenges. So is it the lemon tree grows better than it did last year? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go back to Yvonne's point about tanks. And I, I don't know if it's within our power, but when I was first on the Kinlock Brett Group, they invited me to go and see a development in Cambridge where it was yeah. essential. I mean, there were many things. It was built on sustainability. You had to build a certain way to the sun and they had to be a certain point yeah. apart. And they all had sunken tanks beside their laundry that took the grey water so that they could use the grey water for other things and didn't you? 
are we in it? So who gets to say mm -hmm. that that has to be a condition of a new build? Yeah, Do so we so, get that? Um, certainly, I think that might be in St Kilda where you went, perhaps. It was. Yeah. Uh, and they I, had a I, lot of fantastic yeah. things. They did it beautifully. Yeah, and some of and the St Kilda development was, was quite unique in some ways because actually that was a requirement of the developer for any properties to be built. They had to have a rainwater tank. There was there was no option, um, as well as other other requirements on those sections. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's something to have. You know, I think it's worthwhile in the future having a conversation with developers around how they're going to look at demand management and water usage and other kind of things. Looking at smart. Yeah. And, and and then you can go down the path of um, you know great water use as well. So there's lots of lots of possibilities. I mean, if that's something that the councillors want, you know, and want to push, it's probably something we have to chat with our building team and yeah. figure out how that's then rolled out. Should it I mean, we're trying to get ahead of yeah. I'm, and I don't know where it fits. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not trying to cause an issue here. I just think it's something we should be considering, and if we have any input in it, we should be doing it. Sorry, you got that. I'll, I'll see if I take words out of Julie's mouth. It's a district plan conversation. There were significant submissions on exactly that point, uh, which were heard in the hearings, uh, and we've still got the suite of um, plans in relation to residential, which will be I'm looking at ne next year, perhaps. Um, and I can't tell you where it's landed because we haven't released a decision. I only had deliberations on one plan yesterday, so there's more to come. But a lot of people did submit on exactly that point. Thank you. Well, and now it's not in the plan at the moment. Yeah, I see there's a question here from Karen. It's quite a good ring to you. Yeah. 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 Julie, what's the so, question? Yeah, so I'm, I'm Catherine Fletcher for a second. If installation is due in year six, what advancements would be made in smart metering technologies over that period? That's Councillor Fletcher, who's typing off. Yeah, do, um, don't have a crystal ball, so it's kind of hard, but the, the technology is advancing pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. We've... we've um, the meter we've chosen um, is, and which we're rolling out, has um, a 15-year battery life. So it's, you know, it's got a life of 15 years, which was pretty amazing at the time. You know, a couple of years ago when we looked at it, um, there are some really fancy new meters coming out from Europe at the moment that are slightly different, and they use a slightly different technology, and they're supposedly better at picking up the really low range, you know. Um, uh, water flow, I guess. So, you know, the, the accuracy improves. Um, look, it's something we'll probably track. And at this stage, we, we're sort of committed to these meters because it means we've got one system that we can roll out and, and read them with. But as we probably come to that sort of 15 year period and we're looking at renewals, we'd probably do another sort of assessment, I guess. And if there's something better out there, we'd, we'd consider it. Oh, cool. right. Next one. Or just, uh, well, there's one question, uh, well, two little questions. The main one is, um, so so, so, the reason why it's not hurry, hurry, get this done now is because, well, there was a lake and we've got plenty of water for now, but that, but that's your four seed. Well, well, well um, the limit, if there wasn't a limit on water, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be worried about 50% wasted, would we? I mean, if an unlimited resource, we wouldn't be too worried. The whole point of it is water's a limited resource. But that's, that's the main point of this, isn't it? It is the main point, and I, but but I guess historically there there's, there hasn't been a driver here, and we've probably had plenty of other things to do. I think, and maybe our pipes haven't been as leaky. But every year we leave, we don't do anything. Our pipes get leakier and leakier. Yes. Um, so, look, and and I guess public opinion is changing as well. You know, over time, and I think you know if I sat here when I first arrived at council and talked about metering, I think I would have been kind of laughed at a little bit. But over the you know my six years here. I've got people now that are really keen on it. So, you know, obviously public opinion is changing. Also, so I mean, if we, if we didn't didn't do this at all, yeah. for example, and we got to, what, year 11 or 10, yeah. 10 uh, what, what would be happening? We'd be having water shortages. Yes. Like, yes. yes, that's what yeah. you're saying. So, we're, so we're, based on our current growth model yeah. um, and, and our plans, so we're, we're connecting a number of schemes to TOPOR and the like, right? So including the Centennial Scheme. Mm -hmm. At the moment, when we get to about year 11, we'll be hitting sort of the capacity of the total plant yes, if right. we don't do this metering. No, okay, because up till now, we've got away with it. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 we've yeah, got yeah. pretty 
sprinklers um, on all summer and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's been, yeah. you know, no big deal. And then we, we, we've got the, the, the data and statistics behind us to show the difference, um, you know, the water usage during the summer when people are, there is, what a better word, water wastage. Mm. And then as soon as you get a rain event, then we, you know, it will drop by several, several million litres. Um, so, you know, if we could see where the water is going, literally. Uh, and of course, that's a huge impact on operational budgets of treating the water um, and pumping it into the network. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just too, because I, so there are some schemes in there where they're at the, this meter, too rangy, right? Uh, so, so you must set a rate, rate per litre. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just interested because if, if everyone was, um, yeah, yeah, you'd have to I face it. Not it charges, um, all those different rates. No, okay, no, I'm just interested because, I mean, if, if everyone was water metered, then you'd sort of, well, the whole total cost and you divide by it. But you sort of, of. a lot of work to do in that space. Yeah, yeah. no, but I mean, uh, look, for example, the rate, the water rate, the, the two rangy pay a lot more than, say, someone in Auckland on their meter. Is, is it compared? Two rangy actually pay, yeah, next to nothing. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, currently uh, our, uh, our dollars per meter cubed is um, variable across every one of our schemes. Oh, and, is it? Okay. And, um, you know, they've been set some time ago. They haven't been changed for quite a long time, but it is, oh. it is something we need to look at. Um, they look at it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to make a comment, um, a, a sort of exploratory comment. So in the power industry, there are designated companies that operate the meters through the whole of New Zealand, and they have contracts to do that. You haven't seen anybody coming up in that space yet doing metering for the water um, schemes across the country and taking responsibility for that? But it, it is, um, it's quite common um, at different councils where they've got, you know, a lot of meters that they might contract out the meter reading services. That That is common, and that may be something we look at. I think um, they actually own the meters, don't they, in the power industry? The companies actually own the meters themselves, and like FCL, you know, own all the power meters, and, and they take sort of responsibility and obviously send the information through. So there is that sort of stuff happening. Yeah, oh, I, mean, like it's a, I think with this like program we will we will look at. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just suggest that we have a quick five minute yeah. break. We've got our lovely IT guys here to try and sort out the situation. Um, so we'll come back. Five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've got about five steps. Oh, you got five. Okay. Five minutes. Don't drink too much water, please. Don't drink too much water. The reason is no straight. So it'll be the reason that's off. What if they actually get the reason the reason I'm just talking about the reason high is a mark, right? The volume is right up. I think you need to just send a quick note. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll disconnect. Give me a physical connection from here to there. I was just running through the edge. Yeah, I was through here. So there's no physical connection missing? Uh, sorry, no. uh, just connect the call and restart the system, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I just want to start the way all these schools the way all the here. Um, Jack said that they were presenting through here and um, they still weren't able to hear anyone. Thank you, mate. We just connect calls. Oh, I really that. Thank you. And what 
Invite. Because they need, they said they unplug. Yeah, yeah, that's been smooth. I've been a little bit slow. Okay, now, hello? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's working there. That's a very low, low, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's very low. Ah, the volume yeah. Test, test. There we go. We're doing it. Test. Okay, can I get the people in the meeting to each go through and check their microphone for us, please, one at a time? Uh, Councillor yeah. Fletcher here, mic yeah. check one, two, one, two. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, mic check one, two, one, two? Councillor Fletcher. Yep. Yeah. We, can, we can hear you there, Karen. Sweet. <laughs> If anyone else is there, um, can I please you to check your microphone apart from Karen? Hello, this is Erin. Can you hear me? Thank, yeah, thank you, Erin. We can hear you. She is. Uh, Councillor John Williamson, are you there? Yeah, you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, so I guess kids just and something I <laughs> 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 Yeah, I he was sitting there thinking, I didn't I was asking a staff member, and that's why I don't I'm not going to do that. 
We will carry on with the Tom and Tony show. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony. Back it on. Going well. What's the next project? Next project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the conversation. That's good. We'll crack on. Um, just got a couple of other little projects and then I'll move on to wastewater. Five minutes, Tony. Five, Five minutes. minutes. <laughs> uh, so first of all, I'll just talk about three of the reservoir projects. Um, so the first one, which is in the current LTP as well, is the Kinloch Low Zone Reservoir. Um, so this is a pretty critical reservoir we're working through at the moment, the land acquisition still, um, but we're making some good progress in that space. So it's hopefully going to be up um, on the Kinloch Holdings land and behind the fancy golf course. Um, we've agreed a site, so we're just working through the kind of final bits and pieces around easements and things before we agree a purchase price. We've got some money already, um, and I think we, and it's sort of such delivery, Currently, and in year two and three, there's two and a half and then one and a half million dollars. Um, yeah, and, but it's a critical reservoir without that. If we lose um, treatment capacity at peak time, we sort of got four hours before we're in trouble. So one of the most important ones for us. There's two other in Topo that I've been asked to talk about. Um, both of them were in sort of, Pretty advanced talks with Landcorp around um, swapping part of the old State Highway 5 up to Napier, mm -hmm. which they already basically use. Um, we're going to do a land swap with them, give them that, and they're giving us two reservoir sites. Um, I will be coming to talk to you about that, sort of the sign off for that at some point soon. Um, but the first so the first reservoir I'll talk about is the Napier Road Reservoir. So it's it's up State Highway 5. Um, it's 2,500 cubes, and it basically services um, the EUL, higher EUL growth land. Um, so it's it's a critical project for um, growth in that area, um, including for our property team's aspirations. So basically, if you push this reservoir out or, you know, change the timing of this reservoir, then you'll have to change the timing of some of the property team's aspirations it's currently i think year year two to four um and it's a what five and a half million dollar project so it's it's sort of 300k in year two four million and then a million in year four uh, it's always been pushed out and pushed out and pushed out um but it's a pretty important resilience project as well as you know enabling growth <clears throat> yeah. so this is water yeah. Um, and the other reservoir in Topor is um, what we're calling the Poor Hippie Reservoir. Um, this one's a really big one, 5,000 metres cubed. Um, it's on the north side of the Waikato River, so off Poor Hippie Road, kind of where the Say's Quarry Road goes up, Scoria Road, I think it's called. And so up above Nokoho. And it will ultimately service all of the sort of Nukaho and what we call Woodward areas. Um, there's currently no water storage on that side of the river. So from a resilience perspective, it's pretty important. Um, again, it's been one that's just been pushed out time and time again. Um, it's a pretty significant value. Um, and it's planned for years three, four, and five. Um, the overall value is about eight and a half million dollars. Um, a million dollars in year three, four million dollars, and then three million dollars. Just through the chair, is this part of the plan change? Uh, um, it, it does transition. support, yeah, it, it, it supports the plan change um, growth areas. So, yeah, you know, anyone developing over there is already um, paying DCs towards this project. So it's, all, it's been in the plan for a number of years, but at some point we need to do it. Those areas are currently serviced by pumps. Um, if the pumps stop, people don't have water. So it's, you know, it's a, it's pretty important. Um, are we just looking at raw capex rather than funding and all of that? So that's what it is in raw figures. Yep. But yeah, I'm, yeah, I sort of wonder if um, it's 
not more important to do sooner rather than later, but we can only afford what we can afford, I suppose. Yeah. So I guess we've sort of staged our, our reservoirs to sort of, in a way, we think we can deliver them as well as trying to sort of, you know, put the most important ones first. Sure. So um, through the chair, so connect plan change development, I think it's six or whatever it is, can that start being built for yeah, the reservoir? Yeah. So, so all those areas over there, yeah. including our existing sort of areas, are serviced by pumps now. Yeah. Um, so it just it just puts more reliance on those pump stations, and okay, and they're, cool. they're good pump stations, you know. And we've got generators, and so we've got backup systems, but you know, there's still risks, I guess. Right? Yeah, for sure. I just yeah. don't want to want a hamper. No, um, no, no. It won't. It won't hold sure. hold up. Cool. Thank you. So just for clarity, this project won't impact necessarily the private plan change. This is not a condition of that private plan change. The conditions are around wastewater coming wastewater, back to the, river, the river and the bridge. And the bridge. Thank you. And up to 100 from memory, 140 residences, houses <laughs> can be built prior to anything else being done. Thank you. So it was wastewater. Okay. There are some pipeline upgrades they need to do as part of the, um, the, the plant change areas, but but they're much smaller value and they are there is a separate project for those um putting in the timing of when to do that project is extremely difficult um, and it's more likely that we'll get a block of in that plan change area come to us and say hey we want to develop this block and we'll say okay you need to do that part as part of that development mm -hmm. so. cool. Go ahead. okay Nick. oh just a question for heavy for example like five thousand square cubic meters mm -hmm. right so you had it, had that number pop out? Was it based on forecast? Um, yeah, uh, generally we we base our sizing based on sort of twenty four hours of storage at peak time, it's, and, and plus a little amount for kind of fire. Um, and forecast for development, of course. The, the, yeah, yeah, for the yeah, future, yeah. future growth. So. Twenty years. I mean, they'll last. They'll last us twenty years. The, the reservoirs should be a hundred year kind of life. Oh, oh, capacity. Oh, no, capacity, sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. So our growth model, sorry, is out to 30 years. Um, oh, so all, th all things going to plan, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll run us for 30 years before we need to do anything out there. Yeah. That sort of, yeah. yeah. And, but uh, I, yeah, and I, well, we just don't know what happens beyond that. So we sort of, and there's always a little bit of fat in those numbers as well. Like it's not like exactly at 30 years we'll be at capacity. Right. And, and what it would mean for a reservoir is that suddenly instead of 24 hour storage, you got 23 and a half. So it's not a, you must do something straight away. No, but, but for example, our growth was half of what we expected. We're just but we're overspending. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just on that, the next one. Uh, calculating what our growth is. Mm. Yeah. So, and the next project's a good example of that. Um, find it. Uh, yeah, the MAPRA scheme um, capacity increase. I can't find it. Here it is. So basically, out at MAPRA, we've hit our capacity limitation um, from on our water supply everywhere beyond roundabout Blue Ridge Drive. Um, if you know the MAPRA scheme, but it's kind of from the sort of northwestern portion of of the MAPRA area, and there's still some quite significant um, growth areas out out that way and so i've i've literally had to i've got developers you know on hold at the moment um we've always had this project in the ltp this growth project um but i guess it was never we never saw the amount of growth um or expected the amount of growth we've probably seen in the last three years um been caught a little bit short i guess um so yeah this is a year year one, two and three project doing the critical sort of some pipeline upgrades and a reservoir upgrade, reservoirs at the end of Blue Ridge Drive. Um, it's about a three, three and a half million dollar project, about a million each year. So it's not huge expenditure, but it's, you know, it's pretty significant. Um, and, but we, we sort of, it's sort of, it has to start now or else I've got developers that will be really giving me grief. Um, there is, there's quite a probability that some of the developers may start doing some of the work first. So some of the, 
the funding may reduce. So there's there's a developer out in the Kaipo Road at the moment that, you know, um, I think one of their consent conditions is that they will, they must have these pipe upgrades done to get sign off from the, you know, their stage two lots. So either we will do them or they will put, you know, we'll do the upgrade, sorry, or they will, um, depending on the timing. So. Yeah, just for clarification, this is this trickle feed yep. thing. So it's yep. not actually like turn on a tab and things. Basically, you get a trickle filling up your tanks. And yeah, it's meter. Meter, meter, and yeah. It's, yeah, restricted flow. Um, but the, the system was always designed, you know, quite small, small pipe work and that sort of thing. And the growth is really significant. Um, so, it, look, it's a little bit embarrassing to be at a point where we're having to stop people from developing. But... Mm -hmm. um, we are where we are, I guess. So there's an existing reservoir up the top of Blue Ridge now? Yep. So you're going to put another one alongside? Um, it's only 40 cubes, so it's kind of like just a little tank, really. Oh, so it's, it, it's, we own the land, obviously. We do, yep. Yeah, so we can put a new one. That's right, the plan is to... Because we had a new one down in Casha Bay, didn't we? At the top of... Yeah, the end of Cherry, Cherry Lane. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lane, so so just, we've got a pump station that pumps from that reservoir into the Matra scheme, so okay. up, up the hill and then feeds the whole Matra scheme from there. Yeah. So that'll be, that'll take the pressure off Cherry Lane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. All right, next one. That's all that's from me, I think. Water. Yeah, so that's, pretty huge, that's pretty huge. Right, brother, if you say yeah, so it's a year one. one. Year one started. Yeah. And there's always a balance yeah. between developers and what, what we can get done and what they need to do. So it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act there. Yeah. Okay, we move on to wastewater. So Mike's going to come up for that. And and just uh, so some of the wastewater uh, projects we'll also be talking about. We have that closed session in a little while. Okay, so we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail on some of those. So, um, morning, Mike. Good morning. You got the shitty job. Always. <laughs> <laughs> but a nice shirt. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Better than the other way around. <laughs> 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 How are you, Mike? Good to see you. Right, I see Auckland got some issues at the moment, eh? Some yes. Some mechanics bay and yeah. somewhere else. Did you hear? Could see the guy on TV this morning? No. Yeah, it was interesting. There's more pictures close than you can count on the fingers. What's that? There's more beaches closed up there than you can yeah. count on your hands. Thank you, Mike. What have we got first on the go? Um, so the first one on the list is Mungakino um, Wastewater Treatment Plant. Now, this is two aspects to this project. One is, well, it's really fundamentally driven by growth. And the new growth model suggests there's going to be more demand for housing in Mungakino, be, even beyond what's currently zoned, uh, and we've had um, potential developer also do some economic assessments of the demand for housing in Mangakino, and that uh, aligns with our growth model pretty fairly well. Um, so at the moment, the Mangakino treatment plant is sized for the community that's, that's there, uh, and when the best plant was built 10, 15 years ago, Mangakino was kind of a Sad decline. So it wasn't oversized, it was, if anything, undersized um, houses were being taken away and looked section for repairing. That's all reversed. And uh, WRC, we've gone through a re resource consent process at the moment and they've basically said there's a, a cap on the amount of nitrogen you can discharge from the community, from the plant. And so this project will enable growth and stay within the cap. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly significant rebuild of the treatment plant because the bones of the treatment plant are now too small. So it's not an upgrade, it's a more or less a rebuild. On the existing site, sorry. Yeah, it, I was concerned, is it, um, I suppose you are just going to have to tap on to where it is, because the location is um, very near the lake. Yeah, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. location's near the lake, that's where yeah. all the pipes head. It'll be a pretty major undertaking to shift it somewhere else. Um, the location's fine, there's plenty of space. Uh, where the environmental impact is, is more the disposal fields and, and the, the plant here would improve nutrient quality, reduce nutrients in the effluent, so can enable that growth to occur. So we, the idea is with a cap, regional council are set 
the growth won't mean a more adverse environmental outcome because the trip has to be that much better. That existing site is bigger. Yes. And of course, we're, we're discharging to the golf course at the moment. Oh, yeah, right, across yeah. the road. Yeah. 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 So we've got sides both sides of the boat. Yeah, where, where there will have to be ex some expansion, not straight away, but mm -hmm. um, as need as the growth occurs, is to the disposal field and extra extension to the system within the golf course. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay, yeah, it's uh, good news. Uh, we're talking about Mangakino, growth for Mangakino, isn't it? Uh, it's fantastic, and obviously, Waira and Moana have some aspirations out there, too. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we've been talking with them. Yeah, about oh, you have. Oh, yeah, so they're the ones that have commissioned their external economic report. Yeah, so it lines up with our internal growth cool. model. So, lines up. All right, cool. Thanks. Um, so, the next one is control gates, buffer storage tanks. Now this is quite closely tied into the Topo North discussion we're going to have a little bit. Um, so I'll just touch on it briefly now. Uh, it's basically the capacity over the control gates bridge is limited by the pipes we have and they're at capacity. We've had an overflow a couple of years ago during a storm event from uh, because of the the way those pipes work and the capacity of them. So this project is to enable growth to continue over that side of the river while still having that bottleneck of the uh, pipes across the bridge. Uh, just also comment on the cost estimate. This is probably on the on the high side and uh, just doing a bit of work with some estimates, work with some contractors to get this a little bit more accurate and it's probably going to come down a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of services from other providers in the area where we would need to build these tanks that need to be relocated. So that adds quite a lot. We haven't you know, gone down the detail of that yet, but there's fibre and gas and power and all those things right there. Uh, before you get too excited about that, I'm also revised going to be looking at the cost of the uh, solids filtrate treatment plant. That's likely to go up a little bit by similar amounts. So the program sort of just refining some of these costs as we move through the LTP process. Yeah, so I think that one's, that's the, that's it really. I can probably talk about the Topo North and put it in the bigger context when we get so to that. How much was that last one? No, the, I don't remember anything. Uh, the bridge, we've got just over 5 million in the budget at the moment. It's probably on the high side. But it's, yeah, it's pretty big storage tanks and pretty deep excavations in a pretty challenging location. So. That. So the location that we're thinking for this tank is, as you're heading out of town, you go through the traffic lights on the left-hand side in the road reserve, to on the bank, and the road shoots up the hill. Yeah. So that's where the trunk, there's two trunk sewers from the uh, each side of the Wairake Drive come together and feed the there's two siphon pipes run across the bridge. So it's picking up that point where those two uh, systems come together and then it goes then it goes to the plant yes this is so, so you're, you're building a big storage tank well the pipes the pipes will be bigger pipes across the bridge no, no it's like, you're not going to touch that no it's, well it's a holding it's almost yeah. like a holding tank holding deck. yeah yeah you're right to remove take out the big plugs bigger pipes what is the long term uh, the long term is probably about the total north discussion but it's challenging at the moment there's so much uncertainty around the bridge, the bridge. Yeah. The, um, the alternative to bigger pipes over the bridge is is another pipe bridge standalone. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, I assume that con uh, Mercury are, are part of your process, depending on what happens with. Um, on it, so we're all we're all we'll cover all of that in the next in the okay, yeah. yeah, just if, if the river flow was to change, it would. So this is about works. We've actually got too much flowing coming this way, and there is quite a high risk that a pipe's going to explode. We're going to have all this effluent going into the river, mm. and a lot of very unhappy residents and everything else. So. For me, this is 
a safety measure. This is my personal view, a very, 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 very important safety measure in terms of slowing down and doing a whole lot of good positive things to make sure that what's going through the pipe um, won't go yeah. um, And I'm, I'm making light of it in terms of this conversation, but it's actually um, in some quarters, this is like, uh, it would be unacceptable for, for us not to be doing this. Yeah. Um, there's also some positives in terms of when we have this peak over Christmas, where there's a whole lot more effluent being generated, and um, those tanks will also take a bit of pressure off as yeah, well. So, so a little bit. I would explain a bit more clearly. So there's two, I guess there's two parts to this. There's the existing two pipes, um, uh, what we call siphons, they're not a traditional gravity sewer, they run full with pressure from above, an inverted siphon. Um, anyway, um, they are prone to blockage because of the, the way the pipes lay. Um, and we've had an over the overflow we have had there was about two years ago. We had a storm, um, a whole lot of like the, the fat build up and debris that accumulates in your sewers, it's washed down and partially blocked one of those two pipes across bridge so you have to be quite conservative in what capacity you say those pipes have you can assume your capacity is that they're both running full 100 percent um because when you need them they're likely to be impacted uh, it's just the nature of those pipes and set up so where do the overflow go then uh it comes out of a manhole upstream and then goes down to the river so the river yeah not the lake the river no, goes down flush it down away yeah, yeah. so so, so it's a the river is something that the regional council would significantly prosecute us over um, and a whole lot of bad stuff. So um, polluting the river is not an acceptable outcome for a range of people, including our legal responsibilities in terms of our resource consents, I guess. So, 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 so the tanks are really looking... <laughs> Thanks for looking at kind of a, a, a short term solution, but obviously at the same time doing some future proof work around that, whatever, whatever ultimate the decisions take place, which will come on to the closed uh, session soon. Um, should we move on to the next one? Yes. That's Southern Truck Sewer. Yeah. Um, so the Southern Truck Sewer, I think you are all fairly familiar with. This is the pump station and pipeline, which is going to take all of our wastewater for the, uh, the new growth and um, portion of our wastewater from the southern area, basically by the new countdown in Whareawaka, and pump along Lake Terrace and discharge to Pamanawa Reserve Manhole, which is where the trunk sewer has um, got capacity. And it's been a multi-year project. The original budget that was set about a bit over three years ago was 10 and a half million. Um, some revised estimates are putting this closer to 15 million now. And so um, this project, the, the, the value of this is to increase the budget from what we have in our previous LTPs and annual plan, the annual plan, and to bring it up to what the forecast total budget is. Um, I would say that also that between now and adopting the long-term plan, we will have all of this work hopefully contracted out, so we'll know what real prices are. So the value could go up or down. A uh, little bit, that's our best estimate at the moment. And the timing may also change depending on the contractor's program because this is obviously for year one, which is June. And we look, we've got some money in our budgets already. The contract, if the contractor comes on site in, say, March, is what we're looking at. Uh, how much do they build before June and how much they build after? So the budgets will be a little bit um, fluid across that program. So I'm assuming that would be. A lot of de development contributions from out that way are uh, already there to help the way for from the stock. Yeah. Um, and then, sec but just a question there is no other way of, I'm assuming there's no other way of uh, moving the effluent without putting it so close to the lake. Uh, I mean, there's, you could pump around, yeah. but the extra cost and it's, yeah, it's really significant to go around. Uh, from, I mean, I've can go into the detail. I think we're going to get into the detail. I think it could be safe for another day. But um, in terms of um, 
are you doing things differently for one better word in terms of reducing that risk in yep. terms of so, so the stuff that happened over this? Yeah, so we have we have um uh, discussed the, the the project a couple of times uh in chambers um obviously the, the the benefit of this project is that it's looking at a drilled or a continuous length of pipe not like our current pipes obviously um, <laughs> and the gravity line the existing line will still stay there which we'll be monitoring because we know that, that there's some um challenges with where that's located and this will be a continuous length of pipe modern pipe um pumped so it's not like um it's not a gravity gravity line obviously and we're a lot more smart around how we can operate that um when we get high flows and just for completeness i mean the alternative is develop the stop sound this way yes yes well we, we are already experiencing just for the last summer having I mean, to operate the network slightly differently with uh, some of the pump stations we've got some of the flows that are coming in already let alone the other areas that are developing from a network point of view across the district in you know, bring, you know, pipes and pump stations the two areas that are constrained would be constrained without growth projects uh south area so forth so that's this project address and the north side which is the type of work we're going to talk about those are the two um network bottlenecks we have and the eul feeds into this yes all right yes if we stop that would be sort of stopping ourselves that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in summary we're going through a procurement process at the moment and we will awarding a tender before the end of this year and then we'll start physical work from the council will be paying development contributions towards this project <laughs> through its own development <laughs> okay okay so side stream uh side stream plant this is a substitute project from to a project we had the last ltp and the cost estimate here i mentioned this slightly lower and we'll be bumping that up a little bit uh, so what this plant, this the constraint we have on disposal of wastewater from total scheme and many of our other schemes is nitrogen. And we need to remove nitrogen from um, discharge or from the from the environment. And you can do that in two ways. You can do that through your treatment processes at your plant, which is what we do in Pinlock and most of Turangi, most of our other plants are the nutrient removal plants. We don't have a nutrient removal plant in total, although you get some of this process happening. The, the, the way we remove nutrients here is through growing crops on our farms. So all of that. Nutrient loading rates um, that have been consented are coming down. So it means we can put less um, nutrient, less nitrogen per hectare now than we could uh, a few years ago. So the Rakanu Road consent conditions have got tighter so we've moved from over 600 kilos per hectare a year of nitrogen down to 300 and that's because so much of that nitrogen that we're putting on the land is leaching up the bottom and going straight through the grass is only able to pick up so much so those consent conditions are getting tighter and we'd expect we're expecting they get tighter again when view roads reconsented in 2032 we operate two separate consents for the two separate farms and so what this probe so the old what was in the previous LTP was uh, buy more land, spread the wastewater thinner. What this project is looking to do is um, target one of the streams within our plant. So rather than upgrading the whole plant to provide nutrient removal, we identified that a huge portion of the nitrogen comes from what we call the solids processing parts, so the digesters. It's, up to, it's about 30% of the nitrogen from the plant. So what we can do is target a plant to remove nitrogen from that specific concentrated street. So we remove nitrogen in that plant, therefore you discharge less nitrogen, therefore you need less land to spread it across. So uh, this is a cheaper and quicker way of uh, removing nitrogen and staying within consent limits than buying and expanding across more land. Now it's likely that as we go out another 30 years time, we might be looking at more land again or maybe there's new technologies we can look at but this project should buy us 20 years of uh, asset that's really embracing some some technology looking at some alternatives uh, uh, within the footprint we have down at the uh, wastewater treatment plant now we have got one more last one on here well, just, just a question disposal 
grass only soaks up so much nitrogen and it's over large areas. Is there, is there other crops which soak up more nitrogen? Yeah, I mean, we are, be, uh, we are doing a little trial at the moment with, uh, um, with our contractor on maize. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so we just, yeah, we've done, got, we've got the results of that. So we're looking at those at the moment. But um, yeah, grass is um, pretty common. And, no, yeah, we'll have a good growing, kill but, by the, Yeah, the I mean, the, the amount of leaching um, that we were, were seeing from the Rakanu Road Farm was pretty significant. So that's, and we do see slightly more leaching from the Rakanu Road Farm than we do from View Road. And that's, I think, the technology of pop up sprinklers that aren't quite spreading things as well as they could versus the pivot irrigators, which are much more even and efficient. So there are differences between the two farms, uh, um, but fundamentally, grasses can only grow so fast. And in the last this last year, that we've produced uh, less bales because it's not been sunny, lots of rain, and less sunshine. And okay, the eye of a candle over my, oh, on my left. Sorry, okay. just one thing through the chair. I think <laughs> Councillor Leonard would be a really good person to talk to. She's they've been doing a bit of experimenting with different oh. grass. Yeah. and stuff on their farm um, yeah. around that issues. All right. Um, so that's us on the wastewater, because I think we'll, we'll pick up around Tūrangi wastewater treatment plant, um, site remediation, we'll touch on that, I think we may have our closed conversation. That's okay. us. Yeah. And Greg and the reserves. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Tanya. So we've got about um, 20 minutes before we move into confidence. So we'll work through parks and reserves and then switch back to uh, <laughs> team. Morning, everyone. Sorry, not sure of the order, so we're going to do foreshore erosion first. That's okay. Um, so I'm not sure if everybody's met uh, Melissa Collins. Um, Melissa's uh, environmental advisor in our team, um, who's, who's been helping me with this. With this work, so um, yeah. Good morning, all. A little, a little bit of background, I guess, with foreshore erosion. Um, so, first, first thing to note is it's uh, project watershed, so it is uh, funded, fifty five percent council, uh, forty five percent. Regional council. So I'd like to say that straight off the bat, you've got a 45% saving, but we're all regional council rate powers as well. So I'm sure yeah, it probably doesn't apply. However, it's, um, it's project watershed funded. Um, this is a bit of a program of works, and it's uh, we'll talk we'll talk and hear about some projects, and I, we can get into some detail on that if you'd like, but. But I like to think of it as a program because it is ongoing. And, and the projects that we've put in here uh, are going to make the foreshore more resilient and give it a bit more protection. But we're working with nature, and these are not silver bullet solutions. They're not, they're not build and walk away. So we, we will be in an adaptive process um, if we get these solutions going ahead. And in the program, we've also got some money in there for ongoing beach nourishment and things like that. So just just those sort of points, I guess, to make um, to start off that that um, handout I've given you that's really background reading for later, hopefully. But but we've opened it on page three because there's a little bit there about solutions, and I don't want to get into the solutions right at the minute. But but that mentions this lakeshore um, erosion management plan, a leap, and we've developed that with um, in conjunction with Two Forty Tour. Māori Trust Board, and it's a it's a, a basically a joint document about how we will approach solution finding for these particular sites. So when we talk about offshore breakwaters, or we're talking about groin structures, or we're talking about all those, you get some comfort that we've worked through all of those softer, more environmentally sensitive um, kind of solutions first. And often, when our backs to the wall, we arrive at we're having to do harder structures. It's not our first port of call, but it's um, it's in in some cases where we end up. So um, we've got some money in 
in this year. So just before we get to the LTP, we've got some money to um, be doing some work on the cliffs. Um, and so that's the background uh, document for that. And we actually put that together. Um, we've been in discussions with Trust Board about solutions there for some time, but um, Andrew and I were out on the lake with um, Marco Hotu representatives, and and there's some there's some desire to see something really get going there. Um, and so we've prepared this little background document. Really, as a you know, these are the problems, here's the solutions. So. Um, but year one of the LTP, um, it's actually about Kurato. And and Kurato um, is going to roll, we've got that spread across two years. Um, and the solution that we're looking for for Kurato, we're basing it on a substantial amount of money and we're basing it on possibly up to five offshore breakwater structures for there, um, plus, plus other um, supporting works as well. Um, so those are in the first two years. Um, I guess one thing I will say about foreshore erosion. Um, if you look, if you look at the cycle, it is cyclical. Um, it seems to occur about every time there's a um, a resource consent review possible with regional council. Um, about every five years. So 2011-12 had a whole lot of damage at um, Kurato, um, and that repeated to a lesser extent in 2017-18 and then again 22-23. So it's, it's about a five yearly cycle. So we're right at that point now where, um, where I think we've got hopefully a, an awesome window of opportunity to actually get some works done um, and then we're in a better space before the next five yearly cycle arrives. Um, so that's Kurato, um, Lake Terrace Cliffs. Also, um, we've got we've got some money in there. So the proposal is, if, when when the lake's really low, um, and it shows up in some of those photos there, you'll see uh, you can see some old historic ruins, and they weren't they weren't really properly engineered structures. They were they were a bit of an attempt to hold up some sediment um, as it flowed along the water there. Um, and then we've also got stormwater outlet outlets that are act, that act as drawing structures as well. They, they go out into the lake and interrupt sediment flow. So we'll use those to our advantage. Um, and we'll we'll also um, basically build some better growing structures, feed, feed the beach with sand, and then try and trap as much as we can in there. And that will protect the toe of the cliffs. Um, and then we're already doing some work at the top of the cliffs, um, extra planting, controlling overland flow paths, that kind of thing, to try and get rid of the aggravators from the top. Um, and if we can protect the toe of the cliff, you'll see in some of those pictures there that often, often with high lake levels of wind events, it undercuts and then start to get that that failure. Um, year three, we've got um, a little bit. We're calling it Lake Terrace Kaiwaka Point. If you actually um, get to see the thing, but I know it as the Acacias. So just at the southern end of Waipahihi Bay, you'll see um, as it turns on out onto Kaiwaka Point, there's there's a, a roof of Acacias there of trees and um, there's some undercutting there. Um, what's really impressive, um, we didn't we didn't get an opportunity to deal with that when the when the path was built. But what's really impressive is how well those trees um, are actually <laughs> holding that little piece of foreshore together. So you can see what what mature vegetation can do, um, but but we're just signalling that we'll probably be need to be in there at some stage. It's certainly not a major project compared to the other ones. Um, and then we've also got Hartepe retaining wall. So we've got a little vertical structure out at Hartepe and vertical structures um, that was built some years ago. Um, it's consents coming up. Um, but vertical structures in the Lake Topol environment are terrible. Um, work if they're, if they're in a very, very sheltered situation, but they do not work when, they, when they're facing a long fetch in a lot of weather. Um, so they overtop. They won't. They won't form a beach in front of them. Um, they'll overtop with wave action. Um, they they cut out in behind them. And and where we've got ours, it it originally married up with a series of um, private structures that are gabion rock baskets. Um, and after this last summer, all of those collapsed, um, fallen over. Again, vertical wave action undermined behind them, and it's just left. Over. So 
we're proposing we'll talk to those owners um, and and look at a, a kind of a solution that hopefully gets much better sediment transport around into the bay um, at the southern end of Hartepe, and um, so it'll probably be more like a sloping rock or event or something like that. So that's what we've got on the plan. Um, yeah, if you have any questions on. Uh, just thank you, Your Worship. Um, just around project watershed, um, has been around for a long time and was before the uh, treaty, Nafti Two Fali Tiles Treaty Settlement. Um, so when it comes to this sort of work, and I'm only asking because I don't know, um, is around you know the the project watershed is 55-45 split, but as as the um, owners of the lake, do is there not a contribution towards works from Tukari Tower? Um, so so un, under our current system, not a financial contribution. Um, there's um, but I would say that um, so two forty tours part in this is that they are the lake bed owners and often our structures are sitting on their yeah. land. Everything so yeah. so we need obviously we need to be working together. Um, there is a, a mitigation fund that they uh, have with Mercury, um, and that's so um, Pokuru Marae, Marae um, suffered a whole lot of damage this year. So I think they're they're applying to that mitigation fund. So so there's different funding mechanisms. Obviously we're dealing with with public land. We don't deal with dock land, um, for instance, and we and we don't do private land. So our funding mechanisms around around supporting our work on that land. Oh, that's cool. Like I'm a Crown appointee on the Total New Entier Management Board and yeah. I completely understand Two Fari Towers have been very good to us with our infrastructure that yep. with um stormwater pipes and stuff. So yeah that, that's cool. I just just interested, that's all. Thank you. Daniel. Oh, um, just, just a question. Uh, I imagine lake design will be a lot simpler than ocean, than ocean doing this in the ocean, because it's a lot, I mean, the, the waves are a lot smaller and there's no tide, there's no current flow. This should be a simple job compared to the coast. It should be. It should, um, be. <laughs> it should be, but we have things like river mouth dynamics and a whole lot of other things that... Um, and Topol is an interesting situation because, you know, there's, there's reports out there that say up to 80% of its natural sediment supply has been held up by hydroelectric schemes. So so the whole system's starving, if you like. Um, and so that's that's challenging and trying to get on top of, you know, the thing that the coastal system's got is that there's this almost endless supply of sediment and material. So I, I promised Greg at one point I would stop him before he talked or the rest oh, of the daylight the hours of unfortunate erosion. <laughs> You're going to save us all. That, that, that didn't apply to that day only. That's like a perpetual commitment. So I might just that extension to get back to the other questions because there's there's so much we can talk about. Thank, done that makes it thank you, Worship. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you and your team for the huge amount of time, effort, energy, work, and consultation, and working with the community that you've mm -hmm. done fully aware of what you've been doing and how it's incredibly time consuming. And the wonderful thing about it is that we've actually got something happening and something that I think the community is probably going to be very happy with. Um, I just the question I wanted to ask you was the five offshore breakwaters, um, they are going ahead. We've got consent to do that and that's a done deal, so to speak. No. No. So we're at the, um, okay. so we, had, we had an original proposal of two, right. uh, and we're now looking at that it could be up to five. So that design, we're, we're we're looking into that now. So no, we haven't, and we until we understand that, we we haven't advanced with a with a consent. And you're talking about a time frame of across the next two years. So when we go to the January the third rate pass association meeting, we won't. You know, that alive was she like last year? Well, the, the good news, Councillor Green, is that we will be accompanied. Ah, right. That is very good news. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. That's, that's great. Thank oh. you. Just moving around from Hartepe, Motuary Point. I mean, they've suffered a lot of erosion as well. Is that anywhere on anyone's list? 
So it's on, it's on, um, yeah, it's on 242 as listed. Um, it's, it's not, council, there's not council land there, so we're not, we're not involved with, um, I think there was originally a little bit of reserve strip, it's all gone, um, and it was only a very, very thin piece. Um, but yeah, that whole of the Teddy Bay, we do a little bit uh, in front of the campground, but, but we haven't got an involvement out on the point. But I know they're doing ongoing monitoring and so forth. Certainly, you would be put our land by. Our TP is. Not our land? Yep. It is our land. Oh, that's not very good. Just make follow on. Um, this what I'm alluding to. There are, I mean, in the ocean, in the ocean, there's failed groins that behave not the way they predicted to because oceans are more complicated. Are you quite confident, for example, that these groins will do exactly as we predict? Because, well, the, the lake's less complicated than yep. the ocean. Because, I mean, I'm just thinking, uh, okay, groins. I mean, if you have it directly on shore, uh, swell was well, not going to do much, is it? It's 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 more. It's more that'd be correct, wasn't it? Yeah. So so it captures well the closer the spacing, you capture the different direction. That that's basically. Is it? Yeah. yeah so, at, at, and the risk of getting into yeah. trouble then very well. I mean, have to catch up to you. Like, no, okay. I'm just saying, you know, uh, that there are failed <laughs> ones out there where yeah. councils have been. A lot of money and it does the wrong things. <laughs> yep. Well, maybe I'll just add by saying so. So look at the the solvency who's advising us on this. Uh, Tonkin and Taylor, very very highly regarded across New Zealand for marine and lake and river marine structures. So <laughs> can come back to that at a later date. But it's it's certainly not stuff that Greg and myself have designed. But... <laughs> oh, no. I'm, I'm looking at like Andrew Duff. <laughs> I was just going to say after um Greg and sorry Melissa I was going to say Mel but I don't want to uh, Melissa um have finished with we we will move into confidence um and there's three quite um heavy projects in there to get through as well so um, we'll, we'll have to come back to that we're still yeah thank you guys okay. uh, thanks Greg all right we move um going work. <laughs> Yeah. Just to move into confidence, we do um, cut the video on this one and join the conference.